Hey, welcome back to another great adventure through First and Second Peter. No, all seriousness. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, you caught me in the middle of drinking my coffee, and I hope you're sitting there drinking yours as well, enjoying this wonderful day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, uh, let's pray. We'll jump right back into our lesson and see where we can go. Father God, we, uh, we praise you. We thank you for this day. We ask you, O oh Lord, to continue to guide and direct our hearts and our minds that it may be totally and fully focused on you. And so, Father, today, as we get in your word, lead us, O oh Lord, lead us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, we're going to pick back up in question number 29 on your paper. I know, I know we touched on it last week some. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and, and grab that. We're going to start right there. So let's just look at question 29 on your paper. Because of that, because of why, remember we talked about the angels, um, that situation there, deal, dealing with the angels, which angels long to look for, into. And I shared with you at that point in time that that Christ didn't die to redeem the angels. He died to redeem us, okay? Uh, but because of that, in verse 13, Peter tells us what, tells us we must what? And we ended there about preparing our minds. Look again. Let's just read verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, there on your paper, prepare our minds for action. For action. God wants his children, God wants his kingdom people to be active in the world, to be active in our our communities to be active in everything to be active in everything okay our minds must be prepared for what comes our way temptations trials and so on and so forth now number 30 on your paper notice peter says sober uh, again not living under the influence of this world or other intoxicating substances living totally under the control of the holy spirit now last week i asked you to look up ephesians 5 18 you remember what ephesians 5 18 says do not i'm going to paraphrase it this is mike's redneck translation okay don't don't be drunk don't get drunk on wine because that's drunkenness but be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You see, when we allow the world to stay in our minds, then we're led astray. We're under the influence of the world, the same as we are under the influence of alcohol or uh, some other intoxicant, drugs, whatever it may be, okay? And so, if, if the life of Christ, let me rephrase that, if living in a life for Christ is, is to be consumed by the things of Christ, then we are not to be influenced or living under the ways of the world. Does that, does that make sense? I hope it does. It, it's about who is controlling your life. Um, several years ago, there was a gentleman that came to see me in the middle of the night. And um, he was heavily intoxicated. And he told me that God told him to stop by my house to tell me something. And I looked at him and I said, listen, you are here under the influence of the wrong spirit. 
and he looked at me kind of strange and he said to me, Mike, that's a good one. Uh, you, you see, are we allowing ourselves to be under the influence, under control of the things of the world or the things of Christ? Now, number 31, in order to c complete this task of being sober, Peter informs us that we are to keep our focus on what? Well, let, let's just read that again. To be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The second coming is what Peter here is talking about. Now, there are some commentaries that say that this is talking about when a person first comes to Christ. Well, I, I disagree with that because this whole, this whole message, this whole letter that Peter's writing in First and Second Peter is about standing firm in the faith, okay? It's about standing firm in our faith. It's about standing firm until Jesus returns. Let's go ahead and, and read, uh, pick up with verse 14. And let's do a little bit of reading. Then we're going to come back to our paper since we've already read the whole text. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lust. Ties in with to what uh, Peter was talking about. Which were yours in your ignorance. In other words, he's talking about before you came to a knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Don't conform back to that. Listen, I'm, I'm going to preach for just a second. That's, that's a major problem with so many people. Um, it is they want to, when things get tough, they want to revert back to their former lifestyle. Uh, people, people that are, and this is not stereotyping, it's just a fact. People who uh, find Jesus in a jailhouse, um, some of them make it, many of them do not. Uh, I was talking to a gentleman the other day that's in law enforcement, been in law enforcement for almost 40 years. Uh, he's a very devout Christian, a very devout believer in Christ. And he told me in his personal experience, only one out of a thousand people, only one out of a thousand that profess Christ in a jail stay with Christ. The rest re return back to their former life. And that's what Peter's addressing here. Look, do not be conformed to the former lust, which were yours in your ignorance. Again, not talking about mental capability, but by, uh, before you came to the understanding and knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and read. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's answer a few questions, shall we? In verse 14, he forms, informs us how we are to behave like what? Obedient children. Now, all of you that are parents or were parent, well, I guess once you were a, are a parent, you are always a parent, right? Well, never mind about that. You all know what I mean. Once your children leave your home, you're still a parent, but the roles, the roles change. We want our children to obey, not because we want to control their life, and by the way, if you're a parent that desires to control your child's life, you need to read the Word. You need to understand some things about families and family dynamics and what are our roles and responsibility. But the bottom line is we want our children, when they're children, to be obedient. And when our children become adults, we want them to be we want them to be obedient not to us but to God and his word okay so we are to behave 
no matter our age, to the calling of God's word as an obedient child. So number 33, how is this accomplished? Again, by not being conformed to our former lifestyle. Not going back. Don't, 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 don't go back. That's why I have, um, not, not only me, but many people that I know that have had uh, success in helping people leave, whether it be alcoholism or drug addiction or uh, abuse by a spouse or whatever. One way that a person succeeds in that is by not returning back to where they were prior to their knowledge of God, Christ, and, and, and the life that God's calling us to live. So number 34 on your paper, so what should our behavior be? Peter says very clearly here, holy, like the one who has called us, holy. Now on your paper there, I, I've got here for you, the word holy means to cut or separate. To cut or separate. Now, in the Old Testament, meat was sacrificed. The meat that was sacrificed, it was cut apart. So they didn't put the whole critter on. All right? They cut it. They cut it in sections and put it on the altar and burned it up. All right? To represent something that we are to be cut away from. Cut away from the world. Cut away from sin. Cut away from the things that pull us. <coughs> excuse me. Pull us away from Christ. Again, it ties back to what Peter says. Do not be controlled by the world, do not be under the influence of the world, but be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Keep it all tied together. Don't, let's not separate this, okay? But we are to be holy. We are to be separate from the world. Today, Christians are called, are to be cut apart from the world to render our service to God. By the way, just a side note. Uh, do a little research on your own this week. Look up Romans chapter 12. And I, I want you to study. You can do this on your own. I want you to study verses 1, 2, and 3 of Romans chapter 12. Now remember, keep it all in context. But look at those three verses and see the uniqueness of the parallel between what Paul is saying there in Romans and, and what Peter is saying here in this text. Let's go ahead and get back into our text and do a little bit of reading, and then we'll jump back on our paper. Beginning in verse 17, If you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile ways of life and inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring, look closely, word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of the grass. 
the grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Number 35. From verse 17, how does Peter describe God's judgment? Impartial. Now, that's, that's hard. That's hard for us to understand. I mean, we can say, yeah, I understand. Let me rephrase it. It is hard for me to understand. Because even though I strive hard not to be biased, boy, it's, it's hard for us not to be biased, isn't it? I mean, that's our child, or that's our parent, or that's our sibling, or that's our friend, or whatever. And, and so we, many times we're drawn in emotionally to these, these individuals or whatever's taking place. We don't intend to. It, it just happens. But God's impartial. God does not judge a person by color, sex, status, wealth. He judges a person by their conduct, by the things that we do. Again, I can say one thing and do something totally opposite. We are judged by the things that we do. The words that we say will condemn us. The actions we do will condemn us. The words that we say can save us. The actions we do can save us. You understand what I'm saying here? We're not saved by our deeds, but our deeds demonstrate what we believe and stand for. All right? Number 36. To each one's work informs us that our actions, goes in your blank, our Deeds, go in your blank, again, must line up with our words. Jesus said you will know them, how? By their fruit. Number 37, the term fear used here means to carry a reverence or awe of God. Listen, I, I, I think that's something that we've lost in the the American church, I guarantee you. But this understanding of a fear for God, we need to have a healthy fear of God. All right? Christians do not need to carry a fear of God because the fruit of the Holy Spirit is peace. Also, true love casts out fear. Did you hear about the two boys who were about to commit some crime, one said, I'm not going to do it because of what dad would do to me. But his brother said, I'm not going to do it because of what it would do to dad. Now think about that. Look, look at what these boys said. One of them said, I'm not going to do it because of what dad would do to me. He fears, he fears his father, okay? He knows his dad's going to ring down wrath. But look what the second boy said. I'm not going to do this, to do it because of what it would do to dad. My friends, I, I believe if so many people would understand this in the church today, in America today, it would be a lot different country. Ron Moore is often known for saying, don't give Jesus a black eye. Number 38. The word redeemed signifies an actual deliverance of liberty. In our old self of sin, we were living under the confines of bondage and were captives of Satan. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Number 39. What was the ransom that the Father paid? The blood of His very own Son. His only begotten Son. The ransom is something that only the Lamb of God 
could pay. You remember in the Gospel of John where John the Immerser sees Jesus coming towards him as, as John the Immerser is baptizing in the River Jordan. And there it was John the Immerser who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Only the lamb could pay the price. Number 40, when did God set his plan in place for the salvation of men? It writes, it's right there in the text. Do you catch it? Before the foundation of the world. It's right there in verse 20. Before the foundation of the world. In other words, before Genesis 1-1, it was already in God's mind how he was going to, to uh, redeem mankind, redeem. Keep in mind, real quick, in the Old Testament, the, the Jewish people never had their sins forgiven. They were never forgiven. They were simply rolled back each year. They were rolled back each year that's why every year they had to do their big sacrifice and they had to gather together and every year it was simply rolled back to the next year simply rolled back to the next year the other thing too to keep in mind is uh when the priest when the high priest would would sacrifice all the these lambs all the priests and the high priest together would sacrifice all these lambs they they would take they would take some blood from these lambs and they would put it on what we call a goat and they would put it on its forehead and, and, and cover it. And, and it would send it out in the wilderness as, as a signal that this scapegoat was taking away the sins of the nation of Israel. But that, that true four-legged animal could not actually remove the sins permanently. It simply rolled them back. The precious Lamb of God. And God had this all planned out. Listen, this is not about God setting up in, in, in His glory. He's going, okay, let's see Mike. Well, I'm just going to send Mike to hell. And then there's, there's Don Ritchie. Yeah, well, Don's got some flaws, but I'm going to go ahead and send him to heaven. And then, then there's Ron Moore. And, and then there's Sally. And there's Nancy and... No, God doesn't do that. There is no such thing as the elect in that mindset. The elect, the ones that are chosen, are the ones who respond to the gospel. The one who comes to the understanding of God's saving grace and his knowledge. And how, before the foundation of the world, God had a plan. My friends, that plan is through the church. It's through Jesus Christ. Number 41. In verse 20, the understanding of these last times, quote-unquote, is in regards to the pronouncement of the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Who, who wrote First and Second Peter? It was Peter, the apostle, right? The one that was hand-chosen by Jesus himself. And Peter started in his message, and it shall be... In the last days. Remember Acts chapter 2. Go back to Acts chapter 2. It was the last of the Mosaic period. And the beginning of the Christian period. So all the way up. Until Peter proclaims the gospel message. All the way up to then. Everyone is living under the Mosaic law. Under the Mosaic law. That, that's why things such as. The thief on the cross. You, you can't use the thief on the cross about baptism, either, either for or against. It, it's null and void because the thief on the cross died under the Mosaic law. That wasn't, that wasn't even a, uh, baptism is not even a sign, an evidence of, of salvation. Circumcision was. Peter proclaimed, okay, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. 
when the Holy Spirit came upon and the birth of the church. Number 42. Also notice the word he. He is used in the beginning of verse 20 to inform us it was Christ that God had planned to use in the last time, the last days, to bring about redemption and hope. Number 43, the only way that any man, Jew or Gentile, will come to the Father is through Jesus the Son. Now, we've heard this before. Look in the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14, read the first, well, just read the whole chapter. It would be good for you, but read especially the first six verses there in, in John, chapter 14. Number 44, the resurrection and glorification of Christ gives to us the hope of our salvation. God says, listen, I'm, I'm going to send somebody that will redeem the world, those in the world, not the world itself, the, those that are in the world, human beings. I'm going to send someone by the way, it's his son, into the world that through him all people who respond to Jesus will be redeemed. I'm going to do that. Oh, oh, by the way, not only am I going to do that, I'm going to demonstrate it for you in the fact that Jesus is going to die a very brutal death as a sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world and then he's going to pop back out of the tomb and say, Hey, folks, it's true. Here I am. So our hope of our salvation is, is seen in this. Peter puts a huge emphasis on the resurrection of Jesus through his writings as well as his message on the day of Pentecost. Paul says if Jesus hasn't been Raised from the dead, we're still dead in our sins. If you've never heard this before, please understand this. The resurrection of Jesus is the undeniable proof of salvation for those who believe. Number 45. Since you have an obedience to the truth, carries the understanding that it is a continual act of obedient living. It's a continual act. Listen, coming to Christ is not a one-time deal and you're done. You know, there's so many people that say, well, all you got to do is pray. Just so pray the sinner's prayer. Or some people will even say, well, all you got to do is be baptized. Or some people will say, all you got to do is, is pay your penance or whatever. No, no, no. <clears throat> do we come to God <clears throat> with a prayerful mindset of a heart-filled repentance? Yes. Do we follow it through? with the act of being obedient to the waters of immersion, baptism, to die to ourselves, to receive forgiveness of sins, and the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Is that all? No. No. Remember, my friends, the biblical plan of salvation is we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ at our baptism, at our immersion, to continue that walk, to continue that walk, to continue that walk. That's what Peter is urging us here for. That's what he's trying to tell us. Number 46, sharing brotherly love and loving others is the result, is the result of a life with Christ. We must also understand that an effort must be made to show the love of Christ. Wow, isn't that true? Listen, there are people, I'm one of them, 
that's just hard to love sometimes because I get stuck in myself. I get stuck in my flesh. And I know, I know, I know, I know that sometimes, lots of times, well, I don't want to think all the time, but it could be I'm hard to love. That's okay, so are you. But it's with the love of Jesus Christ. It's through the leading of the Holy Spirit of God that we are able to love even as the world calls them the unlovable. Let's go on. Number 47. A genuine true love flows from the heart. And I want you to put a hyphen there. And I want you to write these words. Heart of God. Number 48. The words living and enduring are present participles. Y'all didn't think I knew that word, did you? Present participles, which means continual. Again, do it now and continue on. Do it now and continue on. Thus it would be the continual living and continual enduring word of God. God's word lasts forever. Number 49, Peter uses grass and flowers <clears throat> that only exist for a moment in time, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. I gave you a, a cross-reference there, Matthew 24. Take a, take a look at that. Number 50, in verse 24, Paul, Peter uses the word flesh, which refers back, refers back to verse 23, where he compares us being born naturally, perishable with being born again imperishable that that listen here's another reference go back please this week go back and study keep it all in context john chapter 3 john chapter 3 what did jesus say to nick who came at night must be born again all tight it's all the same it's all the same Number 40, uh, 51, Peter conducts, concludes, excuse me, Peter concludes this chapter with the understanding that believers, that believers are born again by receiving and responding to the living word of God. By receiving and responding to the living word of God. Hey, real quick, this has nothing to do with Peter, but it has to do with the entire Bible. A person, me or you, it is dangerous to open up our Bible and read this and say, oh, this is what it means, and then turn to another text and say, well, this means something totally opposite mm -mm. from the very beginning genesis 1 to the very end of revelation it's all one meaning don't pick and choose you're not in a buffet you're in the word of god it all comes as one big meal don't just select out the parts that make you feel good don't just select the parts that you like it all comes together. Hey, thanks for joining me today. I hope this has been beneficial to you. Uh, I know it's beneficial to me. It get, makes me get back into God's Word. And uh, so until we can meet again, remember Jesus loves you and so do I. And I pray that you're having a good cup of coffee. Till next week, see ya. Bye-bye.